For this list, we're going to be exploring 10 incredible sci-fi inventions that we could build today. All of these items could be built with today's level of technology and not relying on any significant scientific advancements or unproven theories. Sorry, Star Trek, maybe next time. Warp drive, Mr. Scott. In addition to the list, I'll talk about why we don't just go ahead and build each item. And without further ado, here's the list. Number one, the ray gun. The ray gun is a common cliche in many sci-fi universes. Why use bullets when you can just zap or even vaporize your enemies to death? The ray gun is really a type of directed energy weapon. These weapons are defined by their ability to emit a beam of deadly energy towards a distant target. The weapon can also be arbitrarily powerful, since ramping up the power doesn't require delivering a heavier bullet or payload. Perhaps one of the first proposed implementations of a directed energy weapon was by Nicholas Tesla in the 1930s. Though it's worth noting that similar devices were independently invented by others around the same period of time. Tesla proposed the Teleforce, a weapon that became known as the Death Beam. The concept was very simple, accelerate microscopic particles inside a vacuum chamber and fire them out the nozzle at a target. Tesla described this weapon in 1934, quote, My apparatus projects particles which may be relatively large or of microscopic dimensions, enabling us to convey to a small area at a great distance trillions of times more energy than is possible with rays of any kind. Many thousands of horsepower can thus be transmitted by a stream thinner than a hair, so that nothing can resist. The nozzle would send concentrated beams of particles through the free air of such tremendous energy that they will bring down a fleet of 10,000 enemy airplanes at a distance of 200 miles from a defending nation's border, and will cause armies to drop dead in their tracks. Tesla never did get enough funding to build this weapon. Perhaps the government just didn't believe it would be effective. Maybe the power requirements were too high, maybe the device would have been too massive, unwieldy, and impractical. Or maybe they just thought that the status quo was good enough. Another implementation of a directed energy weapon that is currently being developed for use by the US military is the electrolaser. The concept involves transmitting a bolt of electricity through a laser-induced plasma channel. Basically, it's a lightning gun. This is great for giant warships or military encampments, but somewhat impractical for infantry since the portable power supply alone would outweigh bullets. Pure laser-based directed energy weapons are also a thing, but they are often considered ineffective for most applications due to the high power requirements that high-energy lasers require in order to do long-range damage, and the ability for targets such as aircraft to simply reflect the attack away. Number two, high-speed intercontinental travel. Sci-fi is littered with technologies allowing people to travel around the globe in a flash. But could any of these ideas really pick up momentum? Researchers at MIT seem to think so. They've proposed an underwater transatlantic magnetically levitated vacuum train capable of speeds of over 4,000 miles per hour. At those speeds, you'd be able to travel from New York City to London in an hour. The line would be suspended from anchors on the seafloor and would be completely resistant to earthquakes and bad weather. The reason we haven't started working on the project yet is because of the steep price tag. It could cost up to $175 billion to build, but advancements in automation and manufacturing techniques might one day make this high-speed dream a reality. And if high-speed railways don't pan out, we could always take a spaceship. Advancements in reusable rocket technology might one day make it possible to travel from New York to Japan in under an hour. This isn't likely to hit the consumer market though because of the high costs currently associated with manufacturing rocket fuel. But it could happen if we could somehow reduce those costs. Number 3. Space Mining for some reason, space mining always seems to be associated with super rich, corrupt corporations and man-eating aliens. But in reality, the future is bright, and I for one think that the sooner we can tap into the resources available in space, the better. The idea is to mine ores from asteroids or planets and bring those materials back to where they are needed, whether that be Earth, an extraterrestrial colony, or otherwise. Right now, the high cost of rockets and engineering keeps the dream as a distant reality, but one day this process is going to bring on an industrial revolution unlike that which we have ever seen. Can you imagine what this is going to do to the price of metals? 
It would allow us to build gigantic space stations or even colonies without having to lift any materials into orbit. But the infrastructure required to make this operation profitable and competitive against Earth-based mining is still a long way off. Number 4. Artificial Gravity Artificial gravity in sci-fi is usually a byproduct of the movie industry trying to reduce production costs associated with special effects required to depict weightlessness. In reality, the phenomenon we call gravity is understood to be caused by a distortion of space-time generated by massive objects. And there are currently no known ways to counteract those effects, for instance, by creating opposing gravitational waves. However, artificial gravity is still possible to achieve by implementing a centrifugal pseudo-force. This is the same mechanic that pushes you into the seat of a roller coaster even as it goes upside down over a loop. For instance, imagine if you were in space, standing on the inside of a giant ring. As the ring spins, you'd get pressed into it. And there's your gravity. One of the most well-known implementations of this in sci-fi are the ring worlds in the Halo universe. But the concept goes back much further than that. In 1975, NASA released a proposal for a space habitat called the Stanford Taurus. This massive megastructure would be able to house up to 140,000 individuals, but considering the design would require 10 million tons of mass to be lifted into orbit at great cost, it's no wonder it never got off the ground. Still, it's an interesting and feasible design, and who's to say that asteroid mining and robotic construction won't one day make this a reality for research bases situated in the outer solar system. Number 5. Dinosaurs The idea of bringing back dinosaurs was popularized by the Jurassic Park movies, but the idea of bringing back these prehistoric predators may yet one day be a reality. But unlike the movies, the new dinosaurs wouldn't be based on the premise of discovering and replicating dinosaur DNA. Instead, the dinosaurs brought back would need to be a result of genetic manipulation of their descendants, birds. Technically, the new dinosaurs would be a completely new species. It's a pretty neat concept, but in my opinion, it just seems a little counterproductive. We've got other things to worry about as a species if we don't want to go extinct too. Number 6. Self-Replicating Machines The concept of self-replicating machines pops up from time to time in sci-fi. The machines are usually associated with superhuman intelligence and of course they reproduce out of control and overtake humanity and then a few lone survivors has to fight them off by the millions. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves. Self-replicating robots don't need to be intelligent and I believe that we could build self-replicating robots using today's technology. I mean just imagine if we were to send a vast army of robots to Mercury and the robots would scan mercury for resources and extract resources out of the soil and send those resources back to a, a base that acted as a refinery and manufacturing station. The base could use those materials to build new robots. And then you can just imagine conceptually that you could have some robots that are just specialized autonomous space construction vehicles that could build more refineries and more manufacturing bases. So building something like this doesn't really require any new scientific advancement. All it requires is the right engineering and the initial investment to send all of these resources to another planet to begin with. I mean, I guess we could do it on Earth, but I don't know how profitable it would be because of the upfront engineering costs of building these things. And of course on Earth, it's not really as efficient because we can already build giant machines that are controlled by a human operator that require less upfront engineering costs to develop. So really, this would be something that would be great for mining out other planets, but like I said, it would be a very expensive upfront engineering and deployment cost. And another thing I wanted to emphasize is that the robots could be really dumb, like you don't need super intelligent robots. Which brings me to the next item. Number 7, Superhuman Artificial Intelligence. This is a recurring theme that's been around in sci-fi for ages. And rightfully so, it raises a lot of philosophical issues about what makes us human and whether robots should have rights. Well, I'm not going to get into that here, but I am going to argue that superhuman artificial intelligence is something that I believe possible with today's level of technology. And don't get me wrong, I think there are scientific advancements that will bring us closer to AI. For instance, more efficient transistors, high throughput CPUs, and quantum computers. But make no mistake, those are all catalysts. They are not requirements for AI to exist. We already have the basic technology that we need to have AI. What we don't have is the right program. Now I can already hear some of you guys saying that 
developing the right program is scientific advancement and that should disqualify this from the list. But then I would contend that we already have an automated means of building the AI program without additional human intervention. I'm talking about artificial neural networks and unsupervised machine learning techniques. So in reality, all it comes down to is computing power. And with enough money, you can buy an arbitrary amount of computing power. In the most extreme case, you can imagine that with enough computing power, you'd be able to simulate a whole universe. And if you could simulate a universe, you could simulate the evolution of complex life. It's a lot more practical to just wait for the cost of computing to go down before making any astronomical investments. But you get the idea that it's possible if we had enough monetary investment. Number eight, unlimited power. If you accept that self-replicating robots could be built with today's level of technology, then it follows that we could achieve unlimited power. The sun literally produces energy at an astronomical rate. Each second, it produces enough energy to power our current energy needs for 500,000 years. But capturing the sunlight on Earth is problematic. Solar panels take up a lot of space and they take a lot of energy and resources to manufacture. But imagine if we could send self-replicating robots to another planet to mine it for resources and then manufacture solar panels extraterrestrially. We could place those solar panels in orbit around the sun and then beam the energy back to Earth using lasers. The result could be a colossal swarm of solar generating satellites, also known as a Dyson Swarm. If at any time a satellite were to get damaged, it could be repaired or replaced by a fleet of repair drones. Now the reason I used Mercury as an example earlier is because the number of satellites required to build a Dyson Swarm would be so vast it would require us to sacrifice the entire planet Mercury. Not a bad trade-off considering you get infinite power. Now this might all sound like fiction, but the only thing that's really stopping us from doing it is money. Well, I guess the economics of it don't really work out either because the energy crisis on Earth is not bad enough to force us to switch to space-based power. And it also raises some interesting philosophical questions, like who owns the sun? I mean, if one corporation or government decides to monopolize on the sun, it's not like anyone can come and compete with them. Well, maybe it's not so bad because the price of energy in this system would still be governed by the laws of supply and demand. And it would mean a significant increase in productivity and an overall decrease in energy prices compared to what we pay now. So certainly it would be a huge step forward for the human race. But I think this is a technology that might appear sooner than you might think. But in the meantime, I think we should still keep investing our money into renewables and maybe a little bit into fusion. Number nine, antimatter. Now, to be clear, we already have antimatter, but this is really an interesting thought experiment that derives from the question of what would we do if we had unlimited power? As I mentioned, the price of energy really comes down to the amount of money we're willing to spend on the energy infrastructure. And if the price for energy got low enough, in theory, you could have these really crazy industries start to spawn up that would never have been possible before. And one of those industries is the production of antimatter. Antimatter is great. It's basically like pure energy. So we can store energy as antimatter. And then we can release it in controlled bursts. Or, you know, maybe if the robots start misbehaving, we can chuck an antimatter torpedo at them. But you'd have to be careful. I wouldn't want to be manufacturing this antimatter on a planet because if it comes into contact with the planet, it could wipe out all life on the surface. It would basically be like a bomb. But we could build it in space. We could build containment fields made of electromagnetic force fields. That's been done on Earth on a small scale. We'd have to upsize it, but we could do it. Well, I mean, like, what else are you going to do with all that energy from the sun? But I don't think this would be like Star Trek, where you could use the antimatter to get net power. I think it would actually take power to create the antimatter, and that would be like a storage medium for uh, a burst of power that you can get in the future. And that brings me to the final point on this list. Number 10, interstellar colonization. You know, I'm aware that a lot of this stuff on this list isn't economically practical. But that being said, I actually think that if we put the money into it, we could achieve interstellar colonization within our lifetimes. Like, let's say we built the robots, went to Mercury, destroyed it, built a Dyson Swarm. If we really wanted to, and we invested our time and our energy and our money, we could probably build this thing in like 30 to 40 years. It sounds ridiculous, but that's self-replicating robots. We're talking about exponential growth. But now if we had all this, what we could do 
is use the antimatter to power our spacecraft. Or, you know, another thing that we could do is just use solar sails and then propel the spacecraft using laser beams. Or maybe we can have giant ring worlds that accept power from the Dyson Swarm via a laser to power a particle accelerator and use that as rocket fuel. Or maybe not. Even if we just used a nuclear power ship, that would already allow us to access nearby stars, possibly within the lifespan of a human passenger. You know, maybe to implement a system like this, you would need a little bit more scientific research in the way of antimatter containment or generation. But for the most part, most of it is just using technologies that we already have. So this is all possible right now. Does that mean it's a good idea to build it and that we should invest in it? No, there's probably better things to invest in. But I wanted to do this video anyway because I keep seeing sci-fis filled with time travel paradoxes, mutants, flying killer robots, and all kinds of ridiculous things. And you know, I'm just saying, maybe reality is kind of cool too. Anyway, thanks for watching and if you liked this video, subscribe for more Josh Sideris.